Okay, we are, we are in the middle of our series. We're talking about the Holy Spirit. And so if you're joining us online on Facebook or later on on YouTube, we're glad that you're with us. And I encourage you to, for you too, if you have actually um, not been able to be here for each of the weeks, I encourage you to go back to Livestream Church's YouTube page, our YouTube channel. And if you look under playlist, you're going to be able to find the Holy Spirit Bible study. And you can click play and listen to all, I think we have five put up already, and I think we've got tonight and three more to go. So we'll finish this up by the end of December, okay? So I encourage you, go back and watch, because every week we've built, we've built on, every week we've built on each other, on the thoughts of who the Holy Spirit is, and just going to recap, the Holy Spirit, the member of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, remember Jesus on the mountain as he's ascending, he says, uh, I'm going to send somebody. It's good for you that I go, because if I don't go, I can't send the Holy Spirit. So it's best for you that I leave so that the Holy Spirit will come and he will fill you with power from on high, right? So Jesus ascends to heaven and he says he's going to send a gift, the Holy Spirit. And that's who came on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit is present on this earth. And we keep establishing this thought that the Holy Spirit wasn't born on the day of Pentecost. The Holy, the Holy Spirit has been present since creation, since before creation. The Holy Spirit, you can go all the way back to Genesis 1, and the Holy Spirit was hovering over the waters, hovering over the face of the deep. The Holy Spirit was present throughout the Old Testament. We talked about even a, a man named um, Bezalel, who was a, a skilled craftsman. Like you, Ryan, he worked with his hands. And God, how cool is this, that God took someone who could build cool things, and he gave them such skills that he was able to do his work even better. And he got to be a part of building the temple, but it was because the Holy Spirit equipped him and helped him to do that. And so... We'll talk a little bit more over the next few weeks and keep building on this thought that the Holy Spirit at the point of salvation comes to live inside of us for relationship. Everyone say relationship. He comes upon us uh, at baptism for empowerment, for service. There is a difference. And we're going to do a great job tonight at really laying out this idea of the difference between the point of conversion when the Holy Spirit comes to live in us. It's powerful and wonderful. But if we look at the book of Acts, we're going to see a pattern that we're going we're to see emerge that the Holy Spirit comes, upon, comes within them for relationships at salvation, but empowers them later for service. Okay, a lot of the, a lot of the order for the way I'm teaching is... Some of it is, and you can tell I've used this book well. It's called The Holy Spirit, An Introduction by John Bevere. It's an excellent resource. I just want to always give credit where credit is due, and I don't want to be a pirate and steal anyone's thoughts. But truthfully, the thoughts are in here, right? It's just someone's mind has been able to sequence things and put them in an order that we can understand them well. You ready to jump in? Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, tonight and uh, like three weeks from tonight. Um, we'll pick up with part two, and I'll tell you more about that later. Let's talk about position before power. Position before power. And we're not going to spend a ton of time on this because I want to get more into the Holy Spirit. But it's always about position before the power. So um, we must be positioned with Christ before we can ever do anything of power for his kingdom. So what is our position in Christ? Romans 8, 17, and since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. So what's our position? You're a child of God, right? That's your position. Ephesians 2, 6. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. I, I am brought back to, I'm alive. I'm seated in heavenly places with Christ. That's even just too much to even understand, isn't it? 
but I'm united with Christ. That's the takeaway. I am united with Christ. I'm a, I'm a child of God. I'm united with Christ. 1 Peter 2, 9. But we're not like that. Just know that that is bad. Let's just lump all those things in before that. You are not like that. Bad, okay? <laughs> For you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Okay? I think it was Francis Chan who says he didn't, Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. Isn't that good? Like, he didn't make me good from my bad condition. He made me alive from my dead condition. I, it might be. I just, I'm pretty sure it was Francis Chan who said it. So, so we talk about position before power. We are seated with Christ. We are, we are united with Christ. If you are a child of God, that is your position. Okay? Such a basic principle of Christianity, and yet so often we walk around acting, acting like we're beggars and paupers instead of children of a king. You know? Like, like straighten our crowns straighten your back let's walk like let's walk like children of a king and walk with some power so the the position before the power so now we know our position in Christ let's talk about power before preaching and I just used the word preaching because it had a p and y'all I was just like I was liking that alliteration position before power power before preaching preaching is simply the sharing of the gospel the preaching is not just something that I get to do. Preaching is something that you should do. And let me just say, you should do it with your mouth and you should do it with your actions, right? We preach the loudest message through the way we live. If I'm a nasty, ugly, mean woman and I'm always spouting off at my husband and I'm mad all the time, like my life is pre preaching a message. It's a message you don't want to hear, you know? But instead... My life should be preaching the message of Jesus. Jesus knew his disciples. Listen to this. Such a cool thought. He knew his disciples were going to be anxious to get going and share this new revelation of the Messiah's resurrection. Before they could go, they needed to be fully equipped. Now think about this. I never thought about this till today when I was preparing and I thought, that makes so much sense in my mind now. I just, I love how, guys, I've read this book so many times and still there's just new insight over and over that the Holy Spirit can give to us. And not just from reading a book, like this was just insight. The Lord's like, did you ever think about this, Amy? Think about Jesus told the disciples, you need to wait. You need to go to Jerusalem and you need to wait. You, my mama would say, hold your britches. Right? Hold your horses, hold your britches. Any of y'all ever say that? No, <laughs> britches. Some of us know what britches are. But imagine Peter. We, we've done such a good job over this summer of really laying out this character of who Peter was. Impetuous, gung-ho, let's go do it. Like, Jesus didn't have to tell him, uh, giddy up. Jesus had to tell him, whoa, you know, like, some of us, some people, I would have to be one you would have to tell me to, whoa, not giddy up usually, that I get Peter. Imagine Peter after Jesus on that seashore reinstates him as a disciple and says, you're, you're now going to be Peter. You're the rock, and on you I'm going to build my church. Imagine Peter now. Can you imagine him roaring, rip-roaring, ready to go? And to tell the world that the Messiah who was dead is alive and he's the real Messiah come to set people free. Imagine Peter's zealousness to be able to go out. And yet Jesus says, before you can go preach, you have to go get power. This is going to show us, guys, if the disciples who walked with Jesus for three and a half years, they heard the teaching with their own ears. They saw the miracles with their own eyes. If these guys had to wait for the Holy Spirit, if the power of the Holy Spirit was so important that they had to wait, who do you think you are that you don't need it too? Right? We need the Holy Spirit. 
Okay. Jesus did not suggest or encourage them to wait for the Holy Spirit. He commanded them to wait for the Holy Spirit. Let's look at this, Acts 1, 3 through 5. During the 40 days after his crucifixion, he appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, listen to the word commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Luke 24, 49. And now, this is Jesus, and now I will send the Holy Spirit. Just as my Father promised, but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. Is this a command or a suggestion? This is a command. Those who obeyed, I have in the parentheses 120 or 500. Those who obeyed received the gift. How many people were present in the upper room on the day of Pentecost? 120. But 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians, I think chapter 13, chapter 15, I don't remember, but Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians that Jesus appeared to 500 people after he rose from the dead. 500 people got the same message, but 120 chose to go and obey. Of the 120 that were there, 120 got the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Pretty cool, isn't it? Okay, let's look. Um, I just wanted to read it. So often when we talk about the Holy Spirit, we read Acts 2 when we focus on verse 4 or, or Acts 1, 8. But I want us to read this whole passage, verse 1 through 4. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other language as the Spirit gave them the ability. This is kind of a cool thing. The Greek word for filled that we see in verse 4 there, that word filled is really satiated. Satiated after a meal. Think about after a good meal. And you sit back. Think about Thanksgiving in a few weeks. You're going to sit back. You're going to be more than satiated probably after Thanksgiving. You're probably going to be stuffed. But that, that meaning literally means to supply to excess. The Holy Spirit, the filling, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is to fill you to more than excess. To give you more than is needed. Not just enough but to give you more than is needed of his presence. Okay, are we good? Are y'all with me? Any questions before I jump ahead? Okay, we're good. Signs. Let's look at signs of the filling and the baptism. According to Acts 2, 1 through 4, what were the signs present that day? Just holler them out. Tongues of fire. No, no. What did it actually say? like tongues, flames that looked like fire. I don't know that I actually believe that there were little fiery things on their head. I don't know. There could have been, but it says like, right? If I say she ran like the wind, she's not running. She's not wind. You know, if you're as hungry as a horse, you're not a horse. It's as, right? So I think that it's, we, it was tongues like fire. What else did we hear? roaring like a windstorm. We don't, I don't actually believe there was really a windstorm out there because listen, this, this, was, this was a crowded place. Jews from all over the region were there for a feast because God is cool, because God orchestrated that people from all over would come to this place and hear the Holy Spirit, be filled with the Holy Spirit, be saved, and guess what they do at the end of that feast? Where do they go? Where do they go? Home. They go back home, 
right? They're here in Jerusalem for the feast. They came from their homes. They, they're there. They hear this epic sermon from Peter in Acts chapter 3. And now the feast, when the feast is over, guess where they go? They disperse and they go back home. And what do they take with them? They take salvation. They take the message. They take the Holy Spirit with them. You see how this spreads? Because God's cool. Like God is sovereign is a much more spiritual way to say it. God is sovereign and he orchestrates those details. So my question here, why tongues? You ever ask yourself that? Why tongues? Why did God choose that? And I don't have an actual answer, but I, the thought that John, Pipe, John Bevere lays out in this book kind of is that the idea of our native tongue. Your native tongue is the tongue, is the language that you spoke at birth or, or from your home place. Your heart language is kind of what some people call it, your native tongue. From the kingdom, from the land that you hail from. My thought in reading this today is I wondered, so as a child of God, I am part of that kingdom. I'm part of the kingdom of God, my heavenly kingdom. Why wouldn't it be a logical thing that I speak that language of the heavenly kingdom? You know, why would it, why, why does that seem so illogical? We call them unknown tongues because we don't know what it, when I'm speaking in tongues, the Bible says when I speak in tongues, my mind doesn't know what I'm praying, but my spirit knows what I'm praying, doesn't it? That's like, that's scriptural. What if, what if as a believer, as a child of that kingdom, what if that's my native tongue? What if English, what if English isn't my native tongue? Because this isn't my home. This is just my stopping place. My eternal home is heaven. That's what I was, I was created for heaven. You, Nikki, were created for heaven. What if tongues is the language, our heart language, what we're supposed to be speaking? Okay, we're going to look at four different instances in the book of Acts. And we're going to see how the difference between someone being saved and having the Holy Spirit come to live in them, to fill them with the Spirit, is different from the outpouring and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because I think that this is what gets people tripped up. Now, let me just tell you this. I'm never going to argue with someone over speaking in tongues. Because <laughs> I don't have to. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, have to, I don't have to work to convince you of that. That is not my job. My job, if you ask, if someone asks me questions, um, I'm going to gladly answer them. If someone comes at me and challenges, I'm going to defend what I believe and what I know, but I'm never going to fight with someone over tongues. You know, tongues are of the devil. I, like, I grew up in a place where that was a thought. There were people, and that's a thought around here too, that people thinking that tongues is of the devil. You can, there are, I don't encourage you to do this, but there are um, news broadcasts where they actually go in and they're trying to do these documentaries and figuring out tongues and is it real. And sometimes they just make Christians look like jokes. Uh, so I'm so not into that. I'm not, I'm, but I don't think that we have to pound our fists and fight and prove something. I believe that that like the spirit in us, the fruit of the spirit is love, isn't it? It's joy, it's peace. Those should flow out of us. And aren't those attractive? That's not repelling. You know, I'm not repelled by something that is sweet and good. I'm repelled by something that is nasty and argumentative. So I just, I wanna challenge us in that. So let's look at four different instances in the book of Acts, Acts chapter eight. Philip and the Samaritans, and I'm just going to go really quick through this, okay? Um, now the people believed Philip's message of good news concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. As a result, many men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself believed and was baptized. He began following Philip wherever he went, and he was amazed by the signs and great miracles Pete Philip performed. Let me stop. Philip, um, Philip is the preacher in the story, isn't he? Philip is the preacher, and we've got, I don't know. He might have been. He might have been. Simon. There's this man named Simon, and he's Simon the sorcerer. Actually, we're going to learn 
in a few minutes. Um, Simon is a sorcerer. He hears the message that Philip is preaching, and he gets saved. He gets, he gets baptized, and he gets saved. I heard it. Did you hear it? As a result, many men and women were baptized. Many people were saved. They believed they were baptized. So are they saved? Say yes. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, let me move on to verse 14. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that the people of Samaria had accepted God's message, remember, they're saved already. They sent Peter and John there. As soon as they arrived, they prayed for these new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. So let me stop. They prayed for the believers to receive the Holy Spirit. I'm just going to lay a really good foundation. They're believers. And they send two of their best preachers, right? They send Peter and John to go to Samaria to preach. Verse 16, the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them, for they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands upon the believers, and they received the Holy Spirit. So I just put there because I don't want to forget what I wanted to ask. Why did the apostles send their best preachers to these new believers? They were already saved. Peter and John, the best preachers out of the bunch, 35 miles, 35 miles they had to travel. That doesn't seem like a big deal. That's getting me to St. Louis. That's not a big deal unless I have to walk. (laughs) Then that's a really big deal. Unless I have to ride a donkey, and that's an even bigger deal. I'd probably rather walk than ride a donkey. I don't know. I've never ridden a donkey. But why did they send their best preachers to pray for these guys that were already saved. Do you see how important the Holy Spirit was? Because Peter and John understood by this point, there's more that we didn't even know. Like their eyes were open. They knew so much more. They knew that these new believers were going to need the power of the Holy Spirit. So the two best preachers in the bunch, they saddle up their ponies or whatever they rode, and they traveled 35 miles, and they prayed so that they would be filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given when the apostles laid their hands on people, he offered them money. So I wanted to pull that out. Um, Simon what excuse me Simon was enamored by what he saw and heard so much so that he wanted a part of that um I don't know if Simon repented I don't know it sounds like and I kind of read some commentaries today that people believe different things and that's okay because Peter's reaction is harsh in the next verse he says may your money perish with you I don't think Peter is making a prophetic word that you're going to perish and your money's going down with you. I believe that Peter, it's a word of warning. I kind of think that, that. And what does Simon say? He's like, oh, don't let it be. I don't want that to happen to me. So he, it's very likely that he repented and that he turned away from that greed because he didn't know. Maybe he didn't fully understand. But the same power, the same power of forgiveness that saved us at the point of salvation is the same power of forgiveness that can forgive us after we're saved too. So it's very likely in my mind that Simon could have repented and God could have still used him. Okay, But I bring that up because it does not explicitly say that they were baptized in the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues. But Simon saw something and he heard something that let him know that they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Something beyond just the normal. So to me, it's a logical assumption when you read the rest of the book of Acts that what he saw and what he heard was tongues. Okay? All right, let's look at Paul. Paul of Tarsus, Acts chapter 9. So Ananias went and he found Saul. This is after Saul is he's on the road to Damascus. It's after the Holy Spirit, after Jesus actually, um, confronts him with this blinding light. And he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me, right? And so Saul, at this point, he's saved. Listen to what happens. So Ananias went and he found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, how cool is that? He laid his hands on him and he called him brother. The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, 
has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. He did not say so that you could be saved because Saul was already Paul. At this moment, Paul was Paul and Paul was good and saved. And God did not send him to get him saved. He sent him so that he would get his sight and so that he would be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Apparent, afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength. So here's my thoughts there. Though this passage does not, again, it doesn't explicitly say that Paul spoke in tongues. You can look in 1 Corinthians 14, 18. Remember, this is the verse where Paul says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. In Missouri speak, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all y'all. That's what he would have said up here, right? So he spoke in tongues, and it is logical. Like, God gave us a brain. We can actually connect these dots and say, though, it does not explicitly say in that moment that he was baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. It says that he was baptized in the Holy Spirit, and we know that he spoke in tongues. All right, now let's go to two more incredibly clear examples. There's no refuting the evidence in these two, okay? Peter and Cornelius. I got to tell you, God is funny. In Acts chapter 10, I find this to be kind of an entertaining story, what God does with Peter by giving him these dreams. So there's a man named Cornelius, and I'm not going to have time to go into all the details. Actually, I'm not going to go into any of them, really. Peter, let me just read this. Even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the message. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God. Listen, the Jewish believers, these were people who were already Christians. They were already saved. And what happens when Peter comes and he prays? Then the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and they're baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Do you see what I'm saying here? Are you guys with me? Okay, let's look at the last one. In the, the Ephesian church, in Acts chapter 19, while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast, where he found several believers. Who did he find? several believers. I find this so amazing. The first question he asked them wasn't, are you saved? <laughs> or how are you doing? Or how is the church ministry going? How is the church building fund? How's the new small group ministry? The first thing Paul asked them, listen to what he says. He says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? He asked them, no, they replied. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then what baptism did you experience, he asked. And they replied, the baptism of John. And who did John point to? Jesus, right? Um, Paul said John's baptism called for, for repentance from sin. But John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. And as soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus then, when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Do you see the pattern? So, at the point of, I'm just going to say it over and over until we really, it soaks in our hearts. At the point of salvation, the Holy Spirit comes to live in you. There is more there is a baptism in the Holy Spirit. It is a gift. It is not a weirdo thing. It is not just for the extreme Christians. It is not just for those people. It is a gift to believers, and it was so important. Did I do an okay job of laying out how important the disciples viewed the baptism in the Holy Spirit? Could I do any more? Did I miss something, Brent? Help me if I missed it, brother, because I don't want to miss it. Okay, worship team, come on up. Let me read this last part to you. His presence produces evidence. Again and again, the accounts and acts confirm that when the Holy Spirit was present, people saw and heard the evidence. 
Okay, I have to read this quote to you by Charles Spurgeon because, oh my goodness, it is amazing. Listen, like, listen with your heart to this. Listen to this. Heaven cannot contain the Holy Spirit, yet he finds a home within the hearts of his servants. We are his temple. Each one of his influences will evoke from us grateful praise. If he is like the wind, we will be like wind chimes. If he is like dew, we will bloom with flowers. If he is a flame, we will glow with ardor. In whatever way he moves within us, we will be responsive to his voice. Man, listen, heaven, the world can't contain him, and yet he lives within us. How how breathtaking is that? that the Spirit of God makes his home inside of us. And that is not all. Remember the, the commercials, and there's more. And But wait, there's more. Listen, there's more. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, the disciples got it, that this was so imperative that if they were going to change the world, and that is what they did, That if they were going to set the world on fire, they needed the power of the Holy Spirit. And listen to me, we're no different. If we're going to see the world changed, we got to have the Holy Spirit not just in us, but I need his power all over me. And so do you. You need that too. Okay, listen, this is a place where we're going to pray. This is a moment where we're going to actually pray Because there are some of you who have probably not been baptized with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And we have worked so hard to take away any stigma or fear, okay? The stigma that the the speaking in tongues is the crazy people. We've worked hard to remove that stigma. That, am I crazy? Just say no, because I'm not. Your pastor, I speak in tongues. I'm not ashamed of that. And I'm thankful. I'm thankful that when I don't know how to pray, when I'm praying for one of you and the Lord puts you on my heart, and I may not know exactly what you're going through, but I know the Holy Spirit laid you on my heart, I can pray with utter confidence for you in the Spirit, in my native tongue, in my heavenly language. I can pray for you, and I know that that's a prayer that the Lord is hearing and working and answering. So we've, we've done our work to remove that stigma that the, this is weird or it's only for certain people. We've tried to remove the stigma that this is scary because so many people that I've encountered here, it's just it, since March, since I've been here, so many people have talked about how, well, it's just intimidating or they're just a little scared because they've just seen it. They've seen people who were weird. I saw people who were weird. It doesn't mean it's not legit. I've seen, I've seen people, guys, I, I've, I've been in church services where crazy things happened. It didn't mean God wasn't there. It meant that some human person was overly zealous. They probably did not have a bad heart. They were probably just overly zealous to try and move in the gifts of the Spirit. I just want to be careful not to fault people for being over, a little overly zealous because so many times I've been underly zealous and steered clear of it. Let's stop being underly zealous and let's let's begin to seek the Lord. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to get up from your seat in a minute and I'm going to ask you to come find a place. Now, who am I asking? If you are hungry. I'm hungry for the Lord. I'm hungry for more of the Lord, but I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. So I'm not hungry to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's in me. He's in me. He's on me. I'm baptized. And every day I'm continuously refilling my spirit by praying in the spirit. Okay. But for those of you who are here and you're hungry because you have not experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And tonight you're ready. This is the place to do this. This is a safe and good place. Here's the wonderful thing about it being a Wednesday night is you don't have 60 people looking at you. You know, 
And what, and what we'll do is we'll turn off the camera in a minute when we're ready to pray too. So you don't have the pressure that you're on Facebook for anyone to watch you. Because I any, any barrier I can remove, I'm taking it away. Okay? So I'm going to ask you to come up. And what we're going to begin to do is we're going to begin to worship the Lord. Our worship team's going to lead us in a song. We're going to worship the Lord. Through that worship, I, I'm going to challenge you to do this. Sing a little if you want. Pray a little. First thing we're going to do, we're going to cleanse our heart. We're going to confess our sins. If you've got any, any sins that are in there, any unconfessed things, any bitterness, anger, any unforgiveness, anything like that, anything that you've done that has wounded somebody else, I want you to begin to repent of those sins and just lay them out there to God. Say, God, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I repent, and I want to turn from this. I want to turn from my selfish life that I have chosen to live for myself and to do what I wanted, and now I want to, I want to serve you. Okay? We're going to repent and get, get clean, get that all taken care of. Then we're going to just express our desire. Say, God, you're a good father, and you give good gifts to your children, and you promised the gift of the Holy Spirit to those who ask. And so, Lord, I ask that you would baptize me with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Then here's what you're going to do. I'm just crazy enough to believe it is this simple. I, I literally, like, it feels so wild. I've taught kids for years, and maybe that's why, to me, it feels this simple. But it is. Then uh, we're going to lift our hands, and we're going to begin to worship the Lord. Out loud, actually literally moving your mouth and worship the Lord, making noises with your mouth. We're going to begin to praise him and tell him what we think of him. We're going to lift him up. And I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. If you prayed and you sincerely meant it and you said, Holy Spirit, I want more. I want all of you that you have. You're going to be, as you praise and worship, I know this sounds crazy, but listen to me. What's going to happen is you're going to begin to sense syllables and, and words in your spirit, in your mind. You're going to hear those and you're I'm going to tell you the natural inclination is going to be to think that that's just you and you're making something up. Let me just tell you, the devil, oh my goodness, he wants to mess with us. Remember, if he can't, if he can't take us down from without, what's he going to do? He's going to try and take us down from within. Okay? So you're going to have to, you're going to, have to take control of your thoughts. You actually have control of your mind. Okay? Take control of your thoughts. And as you're worshiping and praising, as you hear those sounds, those syllables in your mind, you're going to actually begin to speak those out. And just like a baby, just like your little bitty baby, Esri, as she, is she making sounds? Is she saying words yet? Do they make much sense? Nah, they probably shouldn't at this point in life because she's a baby still, right? But listen, the more we pray in the Spirit, the more like that language will begin to flow out of us. It is this simple. We don't have to beg. We don't have to stand around the altar weeping for hours and hours. Remember, he's a good father. If you ask a good father for a gift, is he going to give you a scorpion? Is he going to give you a stone? No, he's going to give you the good gift. Are you ready to do this with me? Because I'm ready to pray for you. Like, I can't make any of you move your mouths. But, man, Adam, we saw you get baptized in the Holy Spirit a few weeks ago. That was so legit. The whole, I, I, was, I was just standing there thinking, if he falls down, I hope someone catches that man. Because, listen, I could just see, like, the Holy Spirit was moving on you. You know how I know? You're not a highly emotional man. You, I've never seen you just walk around weeping and crying. I could sense that was the Holy Spirit moving. Listen, if God can do that for Adam, can he do it for you? If he can do it for me, he can do it for you. Okay, I'm going to pray, and they're going to start singing. And if you're hungry, it's going to take a bold step of faith for you to come on up front. Okay? And as people come up front, what I'm going to ask you as the body, as brothers and sisters in Christ, to come stand with them to come stand alongside of them, to begin to worship and praise alongside of them, to begin to pray in the Spirit alongside of people. Can we do that together? All right, let me pray for you. Would you stand up? Let's pray. 
Lord, this evening we come into your presence. And Holy Spirit, I am so thankful that you are here right now. You are moving. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are honored. That we, when we talk about you, you are honored by that. And when you're honored, you show up in places where we give you reverence and honor. And so, Holy Spirit of God, I ask that tonight you would show up. I ask that tonight you would baptize hungry hearts with your spirit, with the evidence of speaking in tongues, that there is no doubt that they met from you, that they were filled and baptized by your spirit. I ask that tonight you would do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If that's you, come down and let's begin to worship the Lord together, okay? Okay. 